we're going to we're going to start our second uh, presentation. Uh, once again, we'll present ourselves all together. John, so that you can stop the recording of this one. We'll yes. Go ahead with the window. Yeah, he he can always he can always um, edit it. Um, so we'll represent ourselves. Um, let's start for with uh, Dr. Natalie. Can you present yourself, please? Hello, everyone. I am Natalie Gomsi. I am a PG year one student uh, in the uh, University of Abidjan, where I started. And I am also a member of the uh, AFN. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Dylan Jofak. Hello, hello, everyone. I am Dr. Dylan Jofak, a general practitioner from Cameroon and member of the Association of Future African Neurosurgeons. Nice to meet you all. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, Asen Nyalunja, can you present yourself, please? Hello, everyone. Hi. Hello, everyone. Hi, hi. I'm Arsene Daniel. I'm from GRC. I'm a medical student in the last year. I'm aspiring to be a neurosurgeon and a member of AFAN. It is a pleasure to meet all of you. Yeah, um, it's a pleasure as well. Thank you so much. Um, Zolo Ivan. Hello, everyone. I am Zolo Ivan. I'm a CPA medical student from the University of Boya in Cameroon. And I'm a member of the Disposition of Future African Neurosurgeon. It's a pleasure being with you. Okay. Um, Dr. Rajiv, if you're still here, can you present yourself? You're muted. I'm okay. I'm Dr. Rajiv Neupane. I'm from Nepal. Uh, I'm a member of the future AFAN, and uh, I'm recently practicing in the Department of Neurosurgery in Nepal uh, as a senior house officer, and I'm interested in the neurosurgery. It's all, it's all my pleasure to meet you all. Hi, everybody. Uh, Hi, um, thank you so much. So um, I'm the last one. I'm Ulrich Sidney. I am the president of the Association of Future African Neurosurgeons. And I am currently a research associate at uh, Programming Global Surgery and Social Change at Harvard Medical School. Um, we'll go on with uh, our presentation. Our presenter today is Darwin Sichimba. Darwin, can you present yourself and start your presentation? Hi. Darren, can you please present yourself? Hello, everyone. Your presentation. Okay, uh, I'm Darren Schimba. I'm a medical student from uh, Cooper Belt University, Zambia, uh, and I'm interested in neurosurgery. And I'm a member of uh, the Association of Future African Neurosurgeons. Uh, so today, I'm privileged and humble uh, on uh, craniotomy. Okay, so we can go to our first. Uh, please hold, hold on, hold on a second, please. Um, okay. It's taking a while um, to load. Okay. Sure. Mm, so while 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 this um, while this loads, we we'll just have to wait a little bit. I'm not sure why it's so slow. So um, um, while waiting for this, uh, I'd like to I'd like to thank everyone who's, who's, who's around at the moment. Um, thank you for all for all those who supported us and have been there from the get from from the first day, especially Don, Dr. John Bennett with Neurosurgical TV. It's been a a really great experience so far. Um, thank you so much, guys. And we hope to to do some really amazing stuff um, um, going forward. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, at the very bottom, uh, Darwin, there, there's uh, some options of the screen. At the very bottom of the screen. I'm the one. I'm the one controlling. It's it's, it's all right. I was oh, waiting okay. for it to load. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Darwin, you can go ahead. All right. Okay. You can give me the first. Uh, I mean, the the second slide. The next slide. The next slide. Okay.
Can you see it? Where the introduction? No, I can't see the. That's it. It's not. Uh, it has not changed. Wow, it's changing here. But hold on. Let me. I'll stop sharing and then start sharing again. I, I switched it. Has it has it changed? No, not yet. Wow. This is this is awkward. Yeah, I think at the bottom, Ulrich, I think it, choose one of those options to make the screen bigger. That may I have. I, I have I have made the screen bigger. Oh, okay, because we're not seeing that, unfortunately. Yeah, I have. It's okay. I don't know why. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why, why either. It's an experiment. <laughs> we, I, we can always edit this out, don't worry. Yeah. Darwin, can you send me the presentation so I can see if I can share with my WhatsApp? Is it possible? Okay. Let me let, let me try to do that. Okay, we can see it now. I uh, wonder if you can make. There we go. Okay, we're seeing it fine okay. now. Okay. All right. Uh, so, uh, just the outline of my presentation. Uh, I'll start with the introduction, then I'll try to define uh, craniotomy and craniotomy. Then I'll uh, basically try to talk uh, more about uh, craniotomy, the indications, contraindications. Uh, Pre-operative pre care, the equipment that is used, uh, patient preparation procedure, uh, monitoring and follow-up, and uh, then complications. Uh, so, for the introduction, uh, so many surgical procedures uh, on the brain or any part of the brain uh, require making an incision uh, through the skull uh, to gain access to the intracranial component. Department. So uh, we should understand that uh, any type of uh, surgery, most likely, that, that will be needed to be done on the brain, will require uh, making uh, this particular incision into the uh, or rather through the skull, so that you have access to the to the brain and uh, other 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 components there. So this incision uh, that is made is either a craniotomy or a craniotomy. Now. In either case, that is uh, uh, both craniotomy and uh, craniotomy are performed in the position that provides the best access to the lesion or part of the brain desired to be accessed. So uh, it is not done at any, any, any point, uh, let's say in the head, but it has to be done at a point uh, that is going to offer the best access uh, to the part of the brain that we desire to, to access. Okay, uh, so just some uh, definition. Uh, craniotomy is a surgical removal uh, of a section of the skull in order to access the intra uh, intracranial compartment. So uh, the portion of the skull temporarily remo uh, removed is called the bone flap. So the bone flap is placed back in its original position. And that is in the case of craniotomy. It is placed back in, in its original position after the hello operation uh, after the operation is done well, da darwin hello? We, we we lost you for a moment can you can you start again um uh, the last bullet point okay so i was saying uh craniotomy is a surgical removal of uh, a section of the of the skull in order to access the intracranial compartment. So the portion of the skull that is uh, temporarily removed is called the, uh, the bone flap. Now, uh, since we're saying that this craniotomy or cran uh, even craniectomy is just the, the initial phase, initial step in uh, uh, to accessing the part of the brain that we want to uh, operate on. So once the operation, in the case of craniotomy, once the operation is done, the bone flap is placed back in its original position. And it is uh, typically fastened using titanium uh, plates and, and, and screws. So uh, for craniectomy, it is a similar procedure as uh, craniotomy, except there, there are either two cases uh, when we look at uh, craniectomy. 
it's either the bone flap is is not uh, placed back at all, or rather never placed at, uh, back at all, or it has to be uh, uh, it has to be kept for some time and then uh, reinserted back. Uh, that is uh, some time after the, the operation is done. So most of the times, uh, when when we don't place it back, we have to do what is uh, sometimes we have to do what is called the canioplasty. Okay, so uh, this is just. Um, uh, we have a, a, a picture sh uh, simply showing the differences between uh, craniotomy and uh, craniotomy. So under uh, craniotomy in there, you can see that it is usually uh, the first part of feather brain surgery. Then the, uh, the bone flap is temporarily removed. Then it is later uh, retained in the skull after surgery. So soon after surgery is done on the brain, the, the bone flap is placed back. But in the case of craniectomy, it is often uh, performed to relieve pressure uh, on the brain. Uh, and the bone flap is uh, surgically removed. It is not immediately put back after surgery. So not immediately, you have to put it back maybe after, uh, after maybe even up, up to a month or so, depending on uh, uh, what, what exactly was being done. Okay, so let's look at uh, more about uh, on, uh, on craniotomy. So the name of craniotomy being uh, being or to be done or rather be, uh, be performed depends on the specific region of the skull where the bone is removed. So in other words, uh, one of the classifications uh, uh, of, of, of craniotomy is by site or by location. That is, uh, for example, if the craniotomy is uh, opened uh, in the frontal bone, it is then called frontal craniotomy. If it is opened in the parietal, temporal, occipital, or suboccipital bones, it is called a parietal, temporal, occipital, or suboccipital uh, uh, craniotomy, respectively. So th this is one uh, one classification uh, that we can, uh, although I've not really uh, outlined the classification on its own, uh, but through the discussion, we'll be able to see that, that, uh, that we may have different classifications, and one of them is classification by by sight. Okay, so um, then if a craniotomy involves two contiguous uh, regions of the skull, it is, it is named for both. So in a case where there are two uh, regions that are being involved in the craniotomy, then uh, the name of that craniotomy is going to be based on, the, uh, on those two uh, portions of the skull that are involved. So for example, if it involves the frontal and temporal bones, it is called frontal temporal craniotomy. Okay. Then um, hold on. Um, okay. Okay. So let's look at another another type, uh, which is a very common type of uh, craniotomy. Uh, in addition to what, what what I've already mentioned, that is a uh, frontal uh, parietal, temporal, occipital, or suboccipital craniotomies. There is another type of craniotomy called uh, 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 ter terrenal craniotomy, uh, which is named for the uh, terion. Now, this terion is is the junction uh, junction of point is the junction of point of four bones within the skull. That is the frontal, uh, temporal, uh, greater wing of the sphenoid and the parietal bone. So uh, let's look at this point, uh, this junction of points. So when you look at the picture there, okay, so in the picture there, the, the second part, uh, that is uh, uh, the, the tail. So usually uh, you can perform a craniotomy at that point or around that point uh, where the, 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 sips, uh, the greater wing of the sphenoid bone, uh, the parietal bone the tem and the temporal bone are, are meeting. So that one is going to be called uh, a terion uh, craniotomy. Okay, then in most uh, elective craniotomies, uh, so like in this case, we can, have, we can have an elective, or we can also have an emergency uh, craniotomy. So, but in the case of uh, uh, of of uh, elective craniotomies, there is use of uh, MRI based. Uh, navigation or software. So the craniotomies are referred, these craniotomies are referred to as uh, stereotactic craniotomies. Now, in this case, 
we're not saying that that uh, that term stereotactic is referring to the location, but it is uh, simply because of the technique that is that is used. Now, uh, emergent craniotomy uh, rarely involve uh, these uh, uh, these uh, MRI based navigation software, or rather, they are rarely uh, stereotactic. Okay. Then the other type that we have also is what is called a, uh, a keyhole uh, craniotomy. Okay. So these are small craniotomies performed in situations that, uh, that require less uh, bone removal. So in a case where you, you don't want uh, to remove so much bone, then you can perform what is called uh, a keyhole uh, craniotomy. Now, uh, these keyhole uh, craniotomies are, are becoming more useful with increasing accuracy of uh, navigation software, like I've already mentioned, and advanced technique, uh, surgical techniques and uh, visualization. So one example of uh, such a keyhole uh, craniotomy, is, uh, uh, which is minimally invasive, is the supraorbital uh, craniotomy, which is also called eyebrow craniotomy. So in this case, uh, the, the incision and bone flap are placed in the region of the patient's eyebrow. So uh, when you look at the picture there, uh, we can see that uh, the bone flap is made just just above the the eyebrow of the patient. Okay. So this one is 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 an example of a keyhole uh, a craniotomy. Then uh, the smallest type of craniotomy is what is called a bar hole uh, or uh, trephination. Now. This type of uh, craniotomy is, is not really regarded as a true craniotomy, and more so as, uh, as its own uh, category of surgical approach because it provides very limited uh, view of the intracranial compartment. Now, like I've already mentioned, the purpose of doing this uh, craniotomy uh, is so, so as to have access to the intracranial compartment and the brain and other, 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 other structures. Now, when you look at this uh, uh, bell hole uh, craniotomy, it does not offer enough access to this intracranial compartment. And this is why it is not uh, regarded as a true crani uh, craniotomy. Now, uh, nevertheless, with the development of uh, the endoscope, this type of craniotomy serves as the entry point for the endoscope in many intracranial uh, approaches. So, uh, with uh, with advance of of, uh, of uh, certain techniques such as endoscopic uh, uh, operations on the brain, so this type of uh, crani uh, craniotomy is also becoming quite useful and uh, and common uh, in such settings. Okay, so making the bar hole involves carefully drilling a small hole into the skull to reveal the dura mater. Uh, which can then be opened to allow further exploration on the underlying brain. So that is that picture is simply showing uh, 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 some bowels uh, that 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 can be made. Okay. So let's look at uh, indications for for craniotomy. Like, now, like I mentioned, uh, craniotomy and the craniotomy they are most the same except uh, in craniectomy, you don't put back the bone flap uh, almost immediately after, the, after the, the surgery is done. So even uh, the, when you look at the indications, they're almost the same, uh, except when we look at uh, craniectomy, it's mostly done, especially when we have uh, raised intracranial pressure. So uh, however, most of the things are, 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 are similar. So craniectomy represents uh, the primary means by which uh, neurosurgeons access the intracranial uh, space. Uh, so diseases that affect the brain uh, and its elements, including the brain parenchyma, uh, vasculature, uh, meninges, and the bone, all require an opening in the skull as the initial step. So, like I mentioned as well, craniotomy and craniectomy, they just uh, they are just an initial step in further surgery on the on the brain. Uh, so therefore, the, uh, craniotomy is the first step to accessing uh, contents of the intracranial compartment. 
So that is just a picture showing uh, uh, just anatomy of of, uh, uh, of 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 the head, showing uh, the, the the skin, uh, the skin of of the scalp, the perisperm, uh, bone sc uh, scalp, uh, and and the other structures, including the the underlying brain and the meninges. Okay, so uh, the, the the indications, the following are some of the basic indications uh, of of craniotomy. So one to resect uh, resection of abnormal brain tissue such as brain tumor. Uh, so in in cases of brain tumors, obviously you have to perform a craniotomy for you to be able to access uh, that brain tumor that is that that is. There. Then also for biopsy, uh, when you want to get biopsy uh, of the brain tissue, uh, craniotomy is also done. Then evacuation of uh, hematoma such as epidural, subdural. Uh, as well as uh, intra uh, intracerebral uh, hematoma, uh, 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 this craniotomy is also done. Then, in uh, microvascular uh, de uh, decompression, such uh, as for trigeminal neuralgia. Okay, so number five, uh, the fifth indication. Uh, in the case of uh, brain abscess, so if you want to drain or remove uh, a brain uh, abscess, uh, then uh, craniotomy is the way to go to relieve intracranial pressure. Now, uh, increased intracranial pressure. Now, this is the case where craniectomy uh, comes into play much. So, whenever you want to re uh, to relieve the intracranial pressure, then usually a uh, uh, craniectomy is done. Then uh, to arrest intracranial hemorrhage. So, in a case where you have a bleeding uh, a blood vessel within within the the, the cranium. Then you have to open the, uh, the cranium and uh, arrest that uh, that bleeding. Uh, to repair or clip uh, a cerebral uh, aneurysm, uh, whether it is ruptured or not ruptured, if you want to just repair that, then you have to do a craniotomy as well. The section of uh, arterial venous uh, malformation is another indication. Uh, then the tenth indication uh, among those that have listed to repair. Uh, to repair skull fractures or damaged uh, meninges. So in a case, let's say for example, in a case of RTA, uh, and then the, we have uh, a, a fractured skull. So have, we, sometimes if you want to, to repair the, 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 uh, the, the fractured skull, uh, then you can, you can also do a craniotomy, as well as in the case of damaged uh, meninges. Uh, then uh, next we have to treat uh, brain conditions such as epilepsy in which uh, the epileptogenic uh, uh, focus or tissue is rejected. So sometimes in this case, uh, they do uh, what is called hemispherectomy and other, other procedures. Uh, the insertion of uh, brain implant, such as a deep brain stimulator, uh, ventricular peritoneal shunt, such as in the case of uh, uh, hydrocephalus, uh, subgero electrodes for, uh, for system uh, monitoring. So these are some of the indications. Uh, of course, there may be other uh, other indications, but these are some of the indications uh, that I came across uh, uh, in this, in this uh, presentation. Then let's look at the contraindications. Now, with contraindications, with, with contraindications there are no specific contraindications for craniotomy itself, okay? But a number of medical conditions uh, may, uh, may make uh, craniotomy a high risk intervention. So uh, whenever I want to do a craniotomy, you have to weigh between uh, the, risks or, uh, the risks and the benefits or rather the, the advantages and the disadvantages of doing that uh, uh, craniotomy. So the following are some of the conditions that increase the risks associated with uh, craniotomy. Okay, so number one, advanced age. So mostly with advanced age, we, uh, we find that uh, uh, patients who are advanced in age, it will be more risk to, to do a craniotomy because of uh, several other conditions that, uh, that come in, or rather that come into play with advanced age. So we, we understand that with advanced age, even uh, 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 patients may start uh, developing uh, uh, conditions such as uh, 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 pulmonary diseases, uh, cardiovascular diseases and so on. So because of that, uh, you find that uh, uh, craniotomy may, may become uh, of, of high risk 
uh, to do on patients of advanced age. Then uh, uh, poor functional status uh, may also uh, complicate uh, craniotomy. Then severe cardiopulmonary disease, like I've already mentioned, uh, they may also uh, make craniotomy to not to be of, of uh, so much benefit. And um, severe systemic collapse, uh, re uh, require, which require, uh, which require uh, uh, intensive care support, such as the case of sepsis. Okay, so these are some of the contraindications that uh, are associated with uh, uh, with a craniectomy. Okay, so let's look at uh, preoperative care. So, firstly, there should be patient education. There should be patient education and consent. So whenever you decide uh, or, or, or discover that you need to do a craniotomy or a craniectomy on a patient, then you have to explain uh, to the patient what you want to do, the, uh, the benefits of the procedure that you want to do, as well as the risks uh, that are associated with uh, that procedure. And then you get uh, the consent. Then other than that, you also have to do uh, a procedure planning, such as brain imaging, uh, which, which may include uh, head CT, CT and geography, MRI, as well as additional tests such as uh, uh, basic blood uh, tests, uh, ECG, chest uh, radiography, uh, depending on the patient, uh, patient's uh, medical history. Because like we have said, we have those contraindications. So you have to make sure that uh, everything about the patient uh, is, is, is okay and you can go ahead with uh, the procedure that you want to do. Okay, uh, let's look at uh, uh, the equipment. So when you look at equipment, it will, it will involve uh, the, the tools that are required to accomplish a standard craniotomy uh, or craniectomy. So it is done in a controlled sterile environment designated uh, operating room. So uh, although this is not uh, so much uh, the case with uh, low middle income uh, countries, uh, where, uh, where, 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 where uh, as compared to, to high, uh, high income countries where uh, there are these designated uh, operating rooms specifically for neurosurgery. So in most cases, uh, like in my country, where, 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 where I'm based right now, where I'm doing my clerkship, um, all operations are done in the same, in the same theater, obstetrics and gynecology, general surgery, uh, orthopedics, and so on. Urology, they're all done in the same, in the same theater. But ideally, uh, these uh, procedures are supposed to be done in a controlled sterile environment, which is de designated for that particular purpose. Uh, the basic objective uh, of this procedure is to remove uh, the bone flap as safely as possible, um, uh, as well as minimize pain and, uh, 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 and blood loss, reduce potential risk for infection, and limit damage to the underlying meninges and brain. So whatever we do, uh, we have to make sure that it is done as safely as possible. And in doing that, it means that uh, we have to limit uh, pain. There shouldn't be pain. There should be very less uh, blood loss. There should be uh, 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 reduced risk, uh, risk of infection and limited, uh, lim limited damage to the underlying uh, meninges and brain. Otherwise, if this is not put in place, then we'll find that, that uh, we're not going to accomplish our goal. Okay, so some of the equipments or rather some of the instruments that uh, are used are as follows. So first we have uh, the skin, uh, the skin knife, which is the, the scalpel. Okay. So some, uh, most of the times, uh, uh, number ten blade is typically used uh, to make the skin incision. The suction tips and tubing uh, for clearing blood for the surgical field uh, from the surgical field to maintain visibility. Then uh, the RNA clip and tissue uh, retraction. Uh, retraction. Uh, so these clips are placed in the scalp, uh, in the scalp edges to uh, stop bleeding, while retractors serve to keep the incision open. Then uh, the, 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 the Layla uh, bar and, and fish hooks. Um, so this is an, uh, an optional setup uh, that allows retraction of scalp and muscle uh, 
uh, for the duration of the operation and is, is mostly uh, mostly used in terrenu uh, uh, then uh, we also have uh, what is called the monopolar uh, electrosurgical unit so which is just a, a, a cut and coagulation instrument for dissection uh, through subcutaneous tissue pressure and muscle while pre, uh, preserving hemostasis. Uh, then uh, uh, bipolar uh, uh, ele electrosurgical unit, so we have monopolar and bipolar. So this provides focus uh, of, uh, fo focused electrocutter uh, of blood vessels as a means of stopping bleeding uh, and can be used uh, safely to coagulate uh, the dura uh, to dissect both normal and abnormal uh, brain tissue. Then you have a periosteal elevator, uh, which is used to lift the periosteum off the skull uh, prior to drilling. Then a uh, high-speed air, uh, air drill. So this accommodates different, uh, different drill bits, uh, including bows uh, and uh, perforators, which are used to, uh, to penetrate the skull and form a bar hole, as well as the uh, the cranial the craniotom with uh, with uh, foot plate. So this uh, the 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 the, the is used uh, is used to cave out a bone flap. Is used to cave out a bone flap from the initial bar hole. Then we have a flap elevator and a pen field dissector. So both you uh, this. Uh, both of them are used to lift the bone, uh, the bone flap after the craniotom has, uh, has drilled out a window of bone. Then uh, lastly, on, uh, on the, the, the tools that are used, we have uh, craniotomy, uh, min, min plate and screw, uh, screw set. So this is a titanium uh, low profile uh, plating system for, for replacing the bone flap after intracranial surgery is completed. Uh, is completed. So like we said, uh, craniot uh, craniotum, you have to put back the bone flap. Uh, so to put it back, you have to use the titanium low profile uh, plating system. Okay, so let's look at uh, patient preparation. So uh, in preparing the patient uh, for this particular procedure, there are certain uh, steps or certain uh, things that have to be done. Uh, before before doing that, so uh, other than the the, the 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 imaging and so on that have to be done. One, we have to to stop or rather to discontinue any blood thinners. Now, you know that uh, blood thinners. If if a, a patient is on uh, blood thinners, then there is high risk of uh, of hemorrhage or rather uh, uh, excess uh, blood loss. So to prevent that. We have to discontinue any uh, blood thinners that the patient is on, such as uh, NSAIDs uh, like aspirin and uh, brufen, uh, and platelet agents, uh, and anticoagulant, uh, anticoagulant medication in order to minimize uh, blood loss during the craniotomy and the subsequent intracranial surgery. So we have to also initiate uh, uh, preparative uh, uh, steroid therapy. So usually, uh, some, uh, usually you can use dexamethasone to reduce cerebral edema uh, due to the intracranial mass lesion, as well as an epileptic uh, therapy, such as uh, uh, phenytoin. Okay. Uh, other than that, we also have to put the, the patient on uh, uh, IV antibiotic administration, which is done usually uh, uh, about 30 minutes prior to, to the surgery. Uh, in the in the operating room, so we can use uh, uh, kefazolin, uh, vancomycin, or clindamycin. So the goal of doing this is uh, simply to reduce the risk of uh, of wound infection from the neighboring uh, bacterial uh, skin flora. So mostly we have uh, uh, Staphylococcus aureus. So if we don't use these antibiotics, then we can uh, we find that there will be increased risk of uh, 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 the cerebral uh, infection. So uh, for some for some craniotomies, uh, typically those involving a large mass uh, uh, lesion with significant underlying uh, edema and uh, and brain shift, 
uh, a diuretic such as manitol is given uh, during, during skin incision from additional uh, brain, uh, brain relaxation, uh, for, for additional uh, brain uh, relaxation at a dose of uh, one, uh, 0 0.5 to 1 gram per kg body weight. Okay, so uh, another thing that has to be done in patient preparation is uh, anesthesia. Okay, so there are two uh, broad categories uh, that are used for craniotomy. Uh, uh, apologies for that, uh, that uh, type in error. That should be for, not, not from. Okay, so uh, we have uh, local anesthesia as well as the general anesthesia. But for most craniotomies, uh, both, both methods of anesthesia uh, are used. So for local anesthesia, Local anesthesia is used, or rather is injected uh, in, the, in the incision site for superficial hemostasis and postoperative pain control. While general, uh, general endotracheal anesthesia is administered for the duration uh, of the operation. Then sometimes uh, what is called uh, awake craniotomy may also be done. So with awake craniotomy, uh, the patient is, 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 is active and you can interact with the patient while the procedure is being done. So uh, I didn't go so much into details uh, with that. Okay. Then we look at uh, position and how do you position the patient uh, during this procedure? So first we look at uh, head positioning. There are two basic uh, ways of positioning the head. That is either uh, unfixed or fixed. So the unfixed approach is used when rapid access is required or stabilization is not essential. While uh, head fixation is achieved uh, with, uh, uh, with three skull uh, pins that are situated in, the, in what is called the, the, head, uh, the head clamp. So the location of the, uh, the craniotomy dictates where the pins are placed in the patient's skull. Then uh, body positioning, depending on the location of the intracranial lesion, uh, there are various methods of positioning the patient uh, on the operating table uh, in order to maximize visualization and improve ac uh, his access uh, to the target. Okay. Uh, so there are, there are four fundamental uh, positions for craniotomy. Uh, that is spine, prone, lateral, and sitting. But this, you can play around with this to have others. So that, uh, that picture diagram is, is showing uh, some, of the, uh, uh, some of the positions that are done. So with A and B, uh, both of them are, uh, are, are spine. Then C and D, C and D that is, uh, they're both uh, lateral. Then uh, uh, E there is, is, uh, is a sitting position. So you can play around uh, with this with this uh, uh, type of, uh, of of positions. Okay, then the intra uh, intra operative uh, procedure. So I didn't I didn't really uh, go much into the the procedure itself how it how it should be done, uh, but I attached uh, that that link of of uh, some video that I came across uh, that that tries to explain uh, the procedure. Uh, the intraoperative procedure. So uh, once I share this this uh, this slide, uh, I hope uh, people can follow that link and uh, try to learn one or two things from that uh, video presentation. Okay, so uh, let's look at the monitoring and uh, follow up uh, uh, after after the the craniotomy. So we have immediate uh, uh, immediate post -crani uh, craniotomy care. So first, you have to observe the patient for at least 24 hours. So ideally, you have uh, maybe 24 to 48 hours in the uh, neurosurgical or rather neurological uh, uh, intensive care unit or general uh, surgical. Case where you, have, you just have one one intensive care unit where everyone requiring intensive care uh, 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 goes. Okay, so do basic laboratory tests uh, uh, for full blood count and uh, basic uh, metabolic panel. Then we can also have one to two hourly neurological examinations. Uh, that is usually it's done by the by the uh, ICU staff. Then the ICU staff they have to note any changes 
in neurological status, that is including confusion, aphasia, uh, cranial nerve deficit, uh, weakness, numbness, or convulsions, and so on. So these have to be noted and reported to the neurosurgeon, the, uh, the, the, the treating neurosurgeon as, 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 as soon as possible. Then uh, uh, we also have to keep the systolic uh, blood pressure between 90 and 140 millimeters of mercury. So the reason is because uh, the pressures ab above this range may risk the patient for hemorrhage into the operative site. While pressures below, uh, below uh, uh, this range uh, may compromise and lead to possible infarcts. Uh, then we also have to uh, continue antiepileptic therapy for 24 hours post craniectomy. I mean, uh, post craniotomy or craniectomy. Okay. So, although sometimes we can prolong uh, this antiepileptic, uh, I mean, uh, this antibiotic uh, therapy as well as antiepileptic therapy, uh, depending on the on the condition of the patient and and, and other uh, other factors that are there. Okay, so let's look at uh, uh, long term uh, long term monitoring. Uh, after the acute uh, postoperative phase, which is uh, 24 to 48 hours of observation in ICU, the patient is uh, transferred to a hospital floor bed where recovery continues. So, um, in this in this in this in this phase, we have to assess uh, in the long term monitoring. We have to assess functional demands by an, an assortment of therapies uh, and, uh, and plans for further care are implemented. Then uh, removal, uh, removal of all dressings uh, can be done on day two post operation and uh, staples uh, or sutures used to close the most superficial skin, a uh, skin layer uh, may, be, may also be removed by day 10 to day, uh, day five to day 10 post operation. Okay, so if recovery continues without any complications after discharging the patient from ICU uh, to the hospital floor bed, and we note that recovery has continues, continued without any complications, then the patient can be discharged as soon as uh, uh, day two or day three post-operation, okay? So hospitalization can exceed this day uh, depending on the specifics of the surgeon. So uh, it's, not, it's not a mandate or we, are, we don't have any specific uh, period in which, uh, during which the, the patient should stay in hospital, but it depends on the specifics of the surgery and other factors or other, other medical conditions or surgical conditions that may be there. But if there are no any complications or any other factors that are there, then the patient can be discharged uh, on day two or day three. Then uh, routine post-operation uh, post follow-up uh, within one to two weeks after uh, uh, hospital discharge can be done. So this can be done uh, even just by the patient visiting, uh, going to, uh, to the office of the, of, uh, of the attending uh, neurosurgeon uh, for, for reviews and other checkups. Then uh, the other component, which is very important uh, after the operation is done, is patient education. And I think this is something that is uh, rarely done, uh, or it should be, or if at all it is done, it has to be done appropriately to make sure that uh, uh, everything is, uh, continues well. So patient education is very, very important. So uh, the patient and family should be given specific instructions on discharge as regards to the patient and anything else that may follow. Uh, so immediate call, one, uh, one of the things that, that, that uh, one of the uh, instructions that uh, should be given to the, uh, to the patient or the family. The reason why the family should also be, be informed about these things is because there are certain things that the patient himself may not notice, but the family member may be able to notice. For example, loss of consciousness or convulsions is not always that the patient himself or herself uh, is going to notice those but, uh, or even behavioral changes, but a family member will be able to notice those things and maybe relatable to, 
to the procedure that was done. So immediate call to the uh, neurosurgeon uh, should be made if the patient or the family member uh, uh, notes any uh, any any clear leakage. Uh, that should not be and it should be uh, it should be any uh, any clear uh, leakage, uh, which should uh, which should be CSF. So uh, as we shall see under under the complications, one of the complications is that we may have CSF leaking from the surgical side. So if the patient or the family member notes any clear fluid leaking from the surgical side, then uh, there should be an, an immediate call to the neurosurgeon and taking the patient to the uh, to the facility to the uh, to the facility. Then uh, bleeding may be common in the first few days, and it may not raise uh, so much concern unless it is very heavy, where uh, we may anticipate or think the patient may have uh, hemorrhagic shock and so on. Uh, but if it is it is minimal uh, within the first few days, it does not raise. It may not raise any uh, any concerns. But if the patient uh, notes any prolonged bleeding, even if it is not so much, because if it is pro uh, prolonged and then it is over uh, a period of time, then it can still lead to other complications. So the patient should report any prolonged bleeding from the site. Then the patient should also report any indications of uh, wound infection. So uh, things such as uh, uh, erythema on, on, the, on, the, on the surgical site, uh, any past discharge, uh, any chills, uh, rigors, uh, uh, fevers, and so on. Those should be reported as well because they may indicate uh, surgical site infection. Okay, the patient should also report uh, anything such as nausea, vomiting, headaches, convulsions, uh, and visual disturbances, and any other changes in uh, neurological status. And like I mentioned, there are some of these changes that may not be noticed by the patient uh, themselves, but a family member may be able to notice these changes and the, uh, the fam that family member should be able to report uh, those things to uh, the neurosurgeon. So this is, this is why it is very, very important to educate both the patient and the, 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 the family members, especially those that are very close. Uh, then hair products other than baby shampoo are also discouraged. Uh, others may introduce infection on the surgical site uh, and so on. Then the patient is also discouraged from uh, picking and manipulating this, uh, the incision. Uh, the patient should also be discouraged from uh, flying uh, for one to four, uh, four weeks, given the possibility of exacerbating uh, air pockets, that is uh, uh, pneumocephalus, uh, that are introduced into the intracranial space during the uh, craniotomy. So during the craniotomy, you find that air is going to go into the intracranial pressure, uh, into the intracranial uh, space. Now, if this patient uh, flies, then these, these uh, air pockets uh, may, may be exacerbated and uh, you have other complications. So let's look at uh, the complications of uh, craniotomy as well as craniectomy, like I mentioned. So being an initial step to accessing uh, the intracranial compartment for further uh, surgical procedures, the complications of craniotomy highly depend on and result from the type of surgery uh, that is being performed after the craniotomy itself. So some of the complications apply to all uh, types of craniotomy and differ from those that result from any prolonged surgery with patients under general anesthesia. Uh, for example, uh, these, these complications are going to differ from things like uh, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, atectasis or pneumonia, or even myocardial infarction. So, but they're going to be related to the craniotomy itself. So uh, the complications uh, may broadly be uh, classified as early complications or late complications. There may be probably other classifications, but uh, these are the ones that I, I probably came across. Uh, so, but each of these complications, whether it is early complication or late complication, it leads to a, uh, most of them, they lead uh, to a change in neurological status. That is uh, initially uh, assessed with a neurological examination followed by agent CT scan of the head. 
So under the under the early complications, uh, some of the early complications can be uh, bleeding or hematoma. Okay, so you may find that uh, uh, there's there's so much bleeding from the surgical site for 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 different uh, reasons. Uh, that's why it is important to 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 do those uh, basic uh, blood tests, such as a full blood count, to to check any uh, if there's any uh, thrombocytopenia and so on. Okay, so that we 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 reduce the risk of bleeding, and we also, uh, like I mentioned, we also have to uh, to discontinue uh, any medications that are blood thinners. Then other complications can be seizures. Then we can also have uh, uh, CSF leakage, you can have uh, cerebral infarct and uh, pneumocephalus. So like I mentioned, uh, during the procedure, air can go into the uh, intracranial uh, space and cause uh, these uh, po uh, air pockets or what is called pneumocephalus. Then uh, on late complications, uh, one of the complications is infection. So treatment uh, of of the uh, of infection can be uh, can be done by antibiotic uh, therapy alone, but typically involved surgery for washout of the wound, followed by long term antibiotic therapy. So most of the times, both of them, that is uh, surgery and and uh, medical, can be helpful uh, in treating these these uh, these uh, surgical site infections. Uh, then uh, late scissors. So an epileptic focus uh, may form secondary to scarring, or rather what is called uh, gliosis. So I find that after, after some time, maybe even up to months, uh, then you find that the patient starts developing these uh, scissors. So in a patient who underwent uh, craniotomy or any, uh, 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 any surgery on the brain, uh, if they start developing uh, uh, these uh, seizures, one thing that we can think about is development of epileptic focus uh, secondary to uh, scarring. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, both craniotomy and uh, craniotomy serve to offer access to the intracranial uh, compartment for many purposes. So like th those indications that, that, that we discussed, uh, both craniotomy and craniotomy offer access to those, uh, to, to, to the intracranial uh, compartment. And we should note that the only difference between uh, craniotomy and craniotomy is that cr with craniotomy, the bone flap is not uh, is placed back. Uh, craniotomy, the bone flap is placed back immediately after surgery. Then with uh, craniotomy, the bone flap is uh, not placed back. In which case, we have to do a cranioplasty after some time, or that bone flap has to be placed back uh, after some time, up to weeks, months, uh, and so on. Then. This can, uh, uh, the, the craniotum may be emergence or elective. So for example, in a case of uh, traumatic brain injury, and then we, we notice that maybe the patient has, uh, has uh, epidural hematoma and so on, then uh, that, uh, that's kind of, uh, that kind of craniotomy that has to be done is emergency. But in cases of uh, uh, tumors, brain tumors, unless otherwise, but in most, in, in most cases, if it is a tumor, then it is an elective procedure. And that is the case where we can even use uh, MRI-based uh, uh, navigation techniques. Uh, then the, 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 the name of the craniotomy being performed will depend on the purpose. Uh, for example, you have uh, what is called decompressive uh, uh, craniotomy. So it will depend on the, on, the, uh, on the purpose that it is serving. It also depends on the site. Like we, we mentioned the location as well as the size. Okay, so for location or other uh, uh, site, you mentioned we can have uh, parieto, we can have frontal, we can have uh, occipital, suboccipital, and so on. Then depending on size, we can have uh, the keyhole, we can have a bar hole, uh, and so on. Then this craniotomy, uh, craniotomy or craniectomy has to be done as safely as possible. Okay, and in doing that, in making sure that it is done as safe as possible, we have to make sure that we minimize pain, we minimize blood, uh, blood loss, uh, we minimize uh, chances of uh, uh, surgical site infection, uh, as well as uh, minimize uh, damage, uh, or any, if anything, prevent any damage to the underlying meninges and the brain. 
So that's what th those are some of the things that may be included in uh, in safety of doing this procedure. Then uh, patient preparation is vital. So you have to make sure that the patient is well prepared. Uh, that includes even patient education or uh, uh, explaining the procedure to the patient and getting the consent from the patient as well as the relatives or, uh, the, or rather the, the, the next of kin. Uh, so post-operative uh, uh, post patient and family education as well as counseling, they are also important. And there are things that should not be omitted in these procedures. Then we have to be sure to look out for early and late complications. So those are uh, some of my references. Uh, thank you very much. Great, great presentation altogether. Thank you so much, Devin. Um, you did a really great job. It's a comprehensive uh, presentation on craniotomies and craniectomies. And I think that's all there for um, medical students to understand and aspiring neurosurgeons. Um, the residents will probably need a little bit more. The, you can find more on Neurosurgical Atlas. Um, you can find that online. You can log in uh, or sign up for free. Um, anyone has a question, suggestion? Hello, Darwin. Really great presentation, really detailed. I think Thank I've learned much. a lot about craniotomy and craniectomy. But I have a question for you. For the contraindication, uh, what do you understand by uh, advanced age? For you, what is oh. the advanced age? Okay. Uh, when we say advanced age, I think it has uh, maybe patients above uh, 65, somewhere there. Uh, they may be considered to be advanced age or maybe somewhere around uh, above 65, I think I can say so. Uh, I stand to be corrected. I don't know, but in some countries in the world, 65 years old is still considered as being young, you know? Okay. But uh, what I just wanted to say is, uh, is, it, uh, is it a relative or an absolute contraindication? Because I don't think it's an absolute contraindication because, you know, sometimes you have these patients. Have you heard about... Uh, Normal pressure hydrocephalus usually happening to patients who have uh, something like uh, 80, 80 years <laughs> old. You, yeah, so usually okay. you have to operate. You have to operate the patient because the patient is presenting with signs which will not subside if you don't do his uh, 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 ventricular shunt. You understand? Yes. Okay. So, uh, okay. You can finish the question, doc. It's okay, Darwin. It's okay. Okay. Uh, so, like, like I mentioned, uh, craniotomy uh, as well as craniotomy does not have any specific con uh, contraindication uh, on itself. Uh, so, these these are uh, contraindications that I I listed. They are not absolute, but they are relative, and in most cases, they come into into play if they are a combination. So, for example, in a case of uh, advanced age. It's not, it's not always that advanced age alone is going to, uh, to limit uh, uh, this craniotomy. But if there are also other underlying factors, uh, such as uh, severe cardiopulmonary disease, then uh, we may find that uh, the risks, there, there'll be high risks of, uh, uh, associated with doing this, uh, this craniotomy. So uh, most of these are not absolute, but they are relative. And there are things that, that can, uh, that you can just play around or rather uh, uh, it's a matter of weighing the, the risks and the benefits of, of doing the procedure. Thank you. And uh, lastly, you talked about uh, the use. We have to educate the patient on the use of hair products. I saw, Sorry? like you said, it is preferable to use a baby shampoo than other hair products. Please, can you explain what that part to me? Okay, it was on uh, uh, on patient education. That is after the operation is done. Um, 
after the operation is done, then you have to educate the patient on more like the some some of the do's and and don'ts that uh, that uh, they should they should uh, they should know. Um, so I, I I mentioned that uh, uh, they have to the patient has to be discouraged from use of other uh, hair products. Like uh, um, other than baby shampoo, probably this is this is uh, associated may may be associated with uh, uh, risk of of infection on the on the stage. Uh, they, 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 I really think of uh, in those lines. So it, okay. I think with uh, allergies, allergic reactions. Uh, or uh, surgical site infections uh, and so on. Okay, it's true. That I don't have any idea about it. That's why I ask. Then the yeah. last, I have just the comment. You know, your presentation was very interesting. Then you arrived on the place where you were showing us the different uh, uh, surgical equipment that we use. Um, I think it would have been better if you would have put images, you know, at least illustrate what you're saying. You called oh. many names of many tools. <laughs> yes. That I don't personally know, you know. <laughs> so I would have been much more interesting for me to at least see what mm. you're talking about. As I said okay. to Zoro once, yeah, is when you're doing a surgery or it's just like anatomy, it's good to a little mm. bit illustrate what you're talking about so that. Uh, is uh, much more, I think, attraction to what you're saying. Yeah, that's true. So uh, I don't know if you, if you complete, if you can complete your 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 presentation with images of those those tools, or I don't know, maybe you leave me the, 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 the to complete myself. But if you can complete it and share it to us, I think I'll be happier than like that. Okay. But it was a great presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doc. So uh, I think before sharing to, to the to the WhatsApp group, I will try to uh, put in more images. Uh, thank you for that, Doc. Okay. Um, there are some really um, great inter comments and questions there. I think I can help for with one of the questions about the equipment and what you can do. Um, this is for everyone out there. If you're interested in going to the operating room, it's all you have to do, come to this website, the Neurosurgical Atlas. You can sign up for free. It's, you, you, need, you don't need to pay anything. So um, let me just show you guys. This is mine, for example. You can log in. And when you log in, you, there's even an application that you, an app. So you have Grand Rounds. Uh, neuroanatomy lectures. You've got chapters as well for uh, neurosurgery residents, and that's what I advise um, anyone to to use. There's a whole a whole um, list here. So non-technical skills in neurosurgery, for example, how do you, how should you behave? Uh, you got the medical student guide for matching, and uh, the transition for um, to the real world for residents and fellows. But you equally have the really more technical neurosurgery. So if you come to operative neuroanatomy, for example, you have this skull anatomy, cerebrovascular, and the whole list. So if you come here, you have everything for the equipment, their names, how to use them, how to position your patients, how to follow up oh, your wow. patients, um, what a resident is expected to do, um, when to do it, how to do it. It's, you have everything. So I advise everyone to take the time to uh, see this. For example, what makes a great rest than this? I, I absolutely love this. Um, operating room etiquette, leadership principles. So please do um, visit this site. You'll find everything there. When you go into craniotomy, operative anatomy, go into craniotomy, you have a whole document on, on the equipment as well. But I, I concur with um, Dr. Natalie. Um, while it's good to know what's done elsewhere, you need to know what's done 
where you live. And you need to know the names of those equipment you use in those settings, but equally know the names of the other uh, equipment. You did a really great job, um, Darwin, and uh, we are all proud. That, that was um, amazing. You came up with some really interesting, interesting stuff. Thank you very much, Doc. Okay. Um, I, I, I noticed you, there are a few places you, you, you weren't exactly sure or maybe struggled with. I, I think one of them was the awake craniotomy and the other was um, when you spoke about uh, pneumocephalus in, in patients that have undergone a surgery and die on a plane. Um, <laughs> So what, what you, for the second point, what you need to remember is, so when, you, when you're going up generally, so you're flying, when you're flying, generally what happens is the pressure drops. So if you remember the formula from chemistry, pressure times mm -hmm. volume, PV is equal to a constant. And that constant was mm -hmm. NRT, where N was the number mm -hmm. of moles, R was... Um, a constant and T was the temperature. So when you take yes. that formula, PV is equal to a constant. So you notice mm -hmm. that every time P drops, V has to increase. So you still get that constant. So yeah. if, you're, if you're flying, the pressure drops. So the volume has to increase, right? Yes. Yeah. So before the patient flies, he undergoes an operation. And since you've opened that cranium, Air is going mm -hmm. to, to be stuck there in the in some of the spaces. So that mm -hmm. air, when the patient gets on the plane and the pressure drops, is going to increase in volume. Okay. And since that space now you've closed it, it's it's back to what it was before, but it has air now. So air constitutes um, a, a foreign body. And you remember mm -hmm. the, the the law of um, the doc the, the Monroe Kelly doctrine. It almost mm -hmm. acts as though it was. Um, blood or maybe a tumor or anything so it starts compressing the brain and the patient might might start showing or manifesting certain signs so that was very good that you you thought that you thought about that I, I think it's one of those things that we can easily forget we don't necessarily warn our patients about that was interesting about awake craniotomy um so you were describing anesthesia local and general anesthesia Mm -hmm. you did a great job um, speaking of, uh, of both of them so general anesthesia if you want to really make it basic what you want in general anesthesia is you want a person to be unconscious but the fact that you're unconscious doesn't mean that you will not move and doesn't mean that you will not feel uh, okay. so for example when you're sleeping you're not really conscious you're not really conscious, but you move, right? You move, you turn in your bed. And if yeah. you're sleeping and someone pinches you, then you feel it. So on, mm -hmm. yeah, you need a drug to make the patient unconscious or the person unconscious. You need a drug to stop the person from moving. And you need a drug to stop the person from feeling pain. So the, 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 the drug that you'll be given, for example, to... Uh, the, 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 to you, for you to get a general anesthesia, you need that those three drugs. So you need a myorelaxant, for example, or a curarizing mm -hmm. agent that will stop you from moving. You need um, a narcotic to stop you from feeling pain, and you need uh, a hypnotic kind of drug to stop you from from being conscious. Now, okay. if you if you're trying to have if you're going to have an operation, and it's a very sensitive area of the brain, then you need to have real-time feedback on how your operation is going and what structures you're touching. And the only way right now is to have the person, is you have you testing that area. So it might be, you might be operating around an area that necessitates skill in, it's around the area of maybe speech or singing or playing violin. So mm -hmm. the best way to do that would be to have the patient be awake Mm -hmm. The patient is awake. While you're operating, you keep asking the patient to do that function. And when you see the function is altered, then you know you are close to a, a potent or eloquent zone. Then you need to go away from it. So how do you do oh, this? Wow. Remember what we said about um, um, general anesthesia. If you're mm -hmm. using general anesthesia, you knock the person unconscious. You stop the person from moving. 
and then you stop the person from feeling pain. So if you use general anesthesia, you can't do that kind of an operation. But the okay. person, you, so you need the person, for example, to, to be conscious and you need the person to be moving. But you still need that person not to feel pain, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to, if you're operating and the person is, for example, playing a violin, they need to be moving and conscious so that when you tell them, can you play for me, please? And then they will do it. Or you can ask them a question in a language and then they will answer. So you need mm -hmm. to take all those other two drugs away. The last drug that you're left with is the narcotic to stop the person from feeling pain. The good thing about the brain is, or neurosurgery, there are only a select few areas where you have pain receptors. Mm -hmm. you, will look, you will look up on that. But yeah, yeah. the obvious thing is the brain doesn't feel pain. It's funny, right? Mm -hmm. It, it gets the information from everywhere else, but itself in itself, the brain doesn't feel pain. So we'll say that for your next presentation, we would like you to present on the uh, pain or nociception on each of the layers that cover. So when you're leaving from the skin all the way down to the brain itself, parenchyma. You, you can take your time. It's, it doesn't have to be next week or next two weeks. So your next presentation, that will be it. So the pain receptors and nociception from the skin all the way down to the brain. This is very important because one of the, as you know, one of the subspecialties in neurosurgery is functional neurosurgery. And in functional neurosurgery, you have to deal with pain. And I mean, if you're going to deal with pain, then you need to understand how pain works in neurosurgery. And it's even more important because in the U.S., there's been this massive story about um, the opioid crisis. Patients who were getting post-operative pain medications got hooked on this medication. So it's important for you to know where the pain originates and how you can deal with this pain, pain management. So it's, it's also part of neurosurgery. Uh, once again, thank you so much. It was a marvelous presentation. Um, you're, you're, you're definitely shining a light on Zambian uh, medical education and... We are happy to have you among us. Thanks.